what I want to do, <clears throat> I know many of you are veterans in the arts, and some of you are, have, are, have just started out. And what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of what the Lord has done in me and through me as an artist and a Christian, and then open it up for questions because you'll probably think of some great things that I won't think of that, that maybe I can address. Um, most of my experience is in non-Christian theater. I mean, like Rob said, I've had the privilege, I just got the huge honor of playing Corey Ten Boom in a world premiere stage adaptation of The Hiding Place at 80 Players in Houston. And um, yay, <laughs> thank you, Byron. Thank you, good to see you. And, um, and my friend Bonnie Keene and I wrote a musical called Women Who Dare to Believe that we traveled around and have performed in several states in the United States where we portray 21 different women from scripture. It's a musical. So I have had the high honor of doing things on stage that were openly and blatantly uh, Christian in theme, but most of my work has been in non-Christian theater. And I, to give you a little background, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my father was a music and drama professor and a singer and was very active in community theater. And uh, so I grew up watching two aspects of his life. He was the worship leader at our church. So I grew up uh, learning to worship as my dad led. And my dad uh, was a serious musician himself and uh, was very um, intentional about the hymns he chose to lead. You know, he was into the Moravian hymns and, the, you know, the, what we call the 600s in the blue book. You know, Be Still My Soul and Jesus Priceless Treasure and all these, where the lyrics were serious poetry and serious theology, and the music was seriously good in the harmonies. So he was all about that. <clears throat> and, I, and he would take, in, when he would um, prepare the worship time each week, he was responsible for everything that happened before the sermon. And uh, he, he took it seriously and would try to um, artistically create a worship experience that wasn't just your typical three songs and a prayer before the main event, the sermon. So I saw him bring artistry to choosing responsive readings and choosing hymns and themes and things to, to help us focus around the Lord's table in a creative way that was especially pushing the envelope and was creative for our denomination at that time. So this would have been in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So you know, today you wouldn't think it was, you know, any big innovation, but it was for its time and especially in our denomination. So I, I, my theology and my, uh, my concept of God was shaped by my dad who I adored and his leading worship and the things I learned through the lyrics of the hymns that we sang. I also watched him make specific choices as well in the, the, uh, the kinds of shows he would be in, in our town. And I would watch him say no to certain things. I would watch him choose not to use profanity. I remember he was offered the role of Big Daddy in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by one local theater company. And he was honored that they, would, they offered him that, but he decided not to do it. Because as you know, Big Daddy, if you, <laughs> if you tried to bleep Big Daddy, he'd be a mime. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't hear much out of his mouth at all. And, it, you know, he takes the Lord's name in vain. It's just, it's just, you know what it is. So he turned it down. And that made an impact on me because, you know, you think, wow, Dad said no to that. And that would have been cool and, and everything. But he, he, he decided something else was more important. So I tell you all that about my dad to tell you, for that reason, I got shaped in how I approached my life as an artist. Uh, when I saw dad make choices and I saw him say no, it taught me that my gifts ultimately are not about me. That, you know, it's always about more than what it's about, but that it wasn't about me and that ultimately I answer to somebody and there is an authority higher than me and I need to bring that awareness into everything I do and all the choices I make. So it taught me that my art and my faith should not be 
They, they should be inseparable because they were inseparable for dad. And I saw him take his faith into his art and bring art into his, the expression of his faith and that they should never be apart from each other and that the sort of the meta perspective, the view over it all is that the arts were God's idea anyway. And, and so whatever he enables us to do is supposed to be an expression back of glory to him, whether it's an overt, overtly Christian message or not. So my first big test about making a choice came very early in my career. Uh, I had been auditioning for a local equity regional theater company that I wanted to get in with them so bad. And as you know, every theater company is a click and you gotta, you gotta get in. And so I had auditioned uh, a few times and had been turned down. Finally, I was hired. I was over the moon excited and did my first production with them and did my, my best to ingratiate myself to them. You know, I, I was professional and, you know, trying to be every a regional company's dream as far as somebody you'd want to hire. And they loved me. And their next show that I would have a chance to audition for them for was Jesus Christ Superstar. Now, I didn't know much about that musical. I had seen it, I had seen the movie when I was a freshman in college and I was too theologically ignorant to have any kind of perception about what Andrew Lloyd Webber was saying in it, you know. So I'm older now, I'm in my early 30s and I'm, I realize I, not right now I'm not, but then, no, I'm way past, double that in your mind. Okay, so at this point in time, I'm in my early 30s, I've ingratiated myself with this company and I'm so excited because I'm in with them and they announce what's coming next and I knew that if I auditioned, I'd get cast, I knew it. And um, I also knew that, I also knew I needed to go spend some time in the libretto. So I did. And by this time, in my early 30s, I, I'd been in the Bible. I'd been studying. And so I had much better perception, much more discernment between truth and lies then. So I sit down with this libretto and I'm reading it and I'm going, whoa. Andrew Lloyd Webber doesn't think Jesus is God at all. Very new age, blasphemous, blasphemous in its doctrine. And the killer, he ends it on the cross. There's no empty tomb and I just go, oh, I want to throw the script in the air. Are you kidding me? So I knew and then I got this heaviness in my heart. I knew what God was saying. You can't just not show up for auditions. You gotta go tell them why. I knew what he was saying to me, and I'm going, oh my gosh. They're going to think I'm such a goody two-shoes. They'll never hire me again. So I prayed up, and I called the artistic director, and I said, hey, um, I want to know if I could come in and talk to you. And he went, yeah. So I made this appointment with him, and I had my little speech prepared in my mind, and I, I went in, and I sat down, and I said, I love working for this company and I want to work for you a lot. But I said, I just want you to know that I won't be coming to audition for Jesus Christ Superstar because um, it's just not the gospel. And the gospel is the most important thing to me in the world. And he leaves, Andrew Lloyd Webber leaves Jesus in the tomb and the resurrection is what it's all about. If we don't have that, we don't even have a gospel. And I'm just so sorry. And I want you to know how much I want to be here, but I just can't be here. And thank you so much for seeing me. And I was putting on my coat, you know, because I had said my speech. And he went, sit down, sit down, sit down. And I'm going, like, I don't have anything else to say. I don't know what else I would say. He wanted to talk to me. He said, you know, when I was a kid, um, some of my parents' friends died. And it really upset my parents. And I remember when I was a kid running out into the street and just screaming because I didn't know about what happens at death. And I thought, oh, no. You know, I, I don't know what I said. Hopefully the Holy Spirit said something sane through me. <laughs> I don't remember. But what I do remember is... 
I don't want to cry. <clears throat> it felt so much better to me to say that than a thousand curtain calls would have felt. Because I thought, you know, I don't answer to him, I answer to Jesus. How could I possibly use my gifts in a production that lied about who he is? So that was a watershed moment. So from then on, I've had other opportunities like that to make a choice. And I don't know if, if knowing this ministers to any of you in any capacity, but what it did for me was help me gain an eternal perspective about who I am in Christ as an artist. And, you know, I, and I also totally believe that heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, will be a city, and that God is the drama king, and the arts are his idea, and he created every bit of it, so why in the world won't we be doing it for eternity? I'm convinced we will be. There, there will be, yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. So we'll be doing drama forever, and maybe Jesus will be on stage with us, or maybe he'll be right there in the front row, but this isn't all there is. And I keep remembering through all the disappointments and the times I have not been cast or have been turned down for something, rejected about something, this isn't all there is. And God is more zealous about the use of my gifts than, than I am. But it's not just about the use of my gifts. He's more zealous about my sanctification and the use of my gifts than I ever will be. So I decided very early, he's my agent. It was his idea to give me the talent. The ball's in his court. My job is to be excellent. My job is to be on time, to be every director's dream. My job is to be, when I walk into audition, the, the auditors go, oh, thank God, Nan's auditioning. You know, I, it's my job to be really good and professional and just, on, you know, whether I was a Christian or not, that's my job. Do what you do and do it great, or don't do it. But... Equally, my job is to go into rehearsal prayed up, to ask God every day, give me a chance somehow to share the gospel today, because I constantly work with people who, who don't care, who don't, who don't know Jesus, who haven't yet trusted Jesus, and who, who are my friends, who I love. So it's my job to listen, to be a friend, to ask concerned questions. You know, to, to love them. It's not just about me and applause and a great review. It's not. So that perspective has set me free. It's taken the pressure off. It takes the sting, the, the, the hideous sting out of rejection. You know, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not right for every role. Every idea I have is not the best one. You know, and so I need to, you know, so you said to sort of get over yourself. You need to trust that he's your agent. He's in charge of your career. He's, those, two, those two passages that are my favorites, the Ephesians 2.10, you all know that one, and the John 15.16. You didn't choose me, I chose you to go and bear eternal fruit. The ball is in his court. So whatever dreams I have, whatever desires to create, and to be known and to be seen, of course we want to be seen and known. You know, if we have all this talent and nobody's watching, what's the point? But, but to know that all of it was his idea, my gifts were his idea, and he is more zealous to see me walk in the works he's planned for me since the, before time, it's going to be okay, and it's going to all come to fruition. And what's different is it's going to bear eternal fruit. Hopefully, I'm pointing people to Christ the whole time. I'm on stage, whether I'm playing Blanche Dubois or whether I'm playing Corey Ten Boom. Which, <clears throat> which brings me to another point I want to talk about in, in what, what, what is my role. Besides being professional, besides being doing the best I can do, <clears throat> besides being a, a Christian and, and full of the spirit and prayed up before I, I'm all tangled up, prayed up before I go into rehearsal. Um, <laughs> the plumb line for me, of course, scripture, scripture is the standard. 
no matter how popular it is or not. Scripture is always the standard. So how do I go about choosing roles? <clears throat> this, this is the, the criteria that I follow. I, I will play a person who makes sad choices, grievous choices, if the playwright shows the consequences so that nobody walks out of there going, boy, I sure would love to be Mama Rose. No, you're not gonna walk out wanting to be her or Blanche Dubois. So I don't have a problem playing someone who makes wrong choices as long as the consequences are shown. I will not ever take the Lord's name in vain. Never. I will not do, be a part of something that condones sin or makes light of it. You know, I, you know, I know the music is fun, but I don't like Grease, because it's all about woohoo, isn't that so funny how, that, how she lost her virginity, isn't that hilarious? <laughs> you raise daughters, and you won't feel that way. So, I don't, I, I can't do that. I can't do it. So, <clears throat> You know, I'm always lining it up with, with scripture. I'm lining it up with what are the consequences? If my daughters, if I don't want my daughters to see me in it, I don't want to do it. Because they always want to see whatever I'm doing. So that's another plumb line. If I don't want my children to see it, or if I wouldn't want my grandchildren to see it, not even a temptation. So if you're struggling, if, you're, if, you, if you in any way are struggling with going, oh, I wanna do whatever it is you do, because I've, I believe it'll give me some acclaim and some recognition, just pray that the Lord, if you want him to give you the desires of your heart, pray that your desires are his desires. That he'll change what you want to line up with what he wants for you. And that will help tremendously. Um, <laughs> let me tell you one fun thing that happened. I want to open this up real fast because I have to stop at a quarter to three and open it up for questions. Um, I was uh, given the opportunity to audition for a movie that was going to be filmed here starring a very famous actress. And, um, <clears throat> and I was getting... I mean, they don't ever cast big roles. I mean, it's going to be filmed here but they never cast the big roles here. You know, they cast them from bigger cities and fill the smaller roles here. So the role that I was being considered for was a small role, but I was continuing to be called back and I was narrowed down between myself and one other person. And I knew, um, see, when you audition, you're only given what's called sides. You're only given two pages. You don't know what the story is. And it's a heavily guarded secret, you know, because they don't want to have their ideas stolen by anybody else in Hollywood. So um, it was coming down very close to the wire. And so I emailed my agent and I said, can I see the script? Because she, she knows me. And she knows I'm very picky about what I'll agree to do. So she, uh, under the wire, got the script to me without anybody knowing it. She sent it to me <clears throat> in an attachment. So I'm <laughs> sitting on my patio, getting up on the screen and reading it, and it was like, <laughs> it was like a deer in the headlights. I, I was horrified at some of the things that happened in this movie. And uh, so I emailed her back. I said, take me out of the running. She said, I knew I was gonna lose you when you read the script. So she emails the director and said, Nan Gurley's backed out. She doesn't want to be considered. And he went, why? So my agent emailed me back. She said, he wants to know why. I said, he really wants to know why? I said, yeah. And she said, yeah. I said, okay. So another time, I, this is another chance. And I'm going, oh, Lord God, give me the words. Because how many times do you get the chance to tell a director why you won't do something he's directing? How many times do you get to share the gospel with somebody who asks wants to know why you did what you did. So I wrote a very gracious thing uh, saying, you know, I'm grateful, but I'm disturbed by... Oh, and his question to my agent was, 
She doesn't want to do it. Well, what was it in the script that made her flinch? He actually asked that. I was like... <laughs> so, um, you know, I wrote him back and had the chance to share who I am and what I believe in. And I had said to him, I have daughters and they care about what, they want to see what I do. And I couldn't be a part of this. So you never know how God is going to use you or what doors he's going to open. But as I say, if you can get the meta narrative in your head about who's in charge, what the goal is, the goal is your sanctification and his glory and all that's going to work out. All we have to do is be faithful, be face down in the word, face down in prayer, constantly asking for the leading of the Holy Spirit for everything and it's all going to work out and we're going to get to use our gifts forever and ever. Hallelujah. So <laughs> that's the big picture for me. So uh, that's it. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So if you've got anything you want to ask me, feel free. Did you get any response to your reply? No. No. None that I knew of. But it was really interesting because he, he was sincere in wanting to know and I didn't get the feeling that he would diss what I said. Oh yeah, they've got a mic. If this gentleman here in the red vest. <clears throat> Have you uh, ever, uh, well, let's say, a script and asked you to hold on one second thoughts. so we can get this to the podcast or whatever that thing's called? Thanks. <laughs> if you. Uh, have uh, looked at a script and it has uh, the character using the F-bomb a few times and you go to the uh, director and say, I'm sorry, I'll, I'm willing to do the role but not use the F-bomb. Mm -hmm. Have they ever said yes? Oh, yeah, all the time. People go, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, especially if you're kind and gracious about it. See, I just can't do that. that that's also when it really, really helps if you're good at what you do because they'd rather have you than the F-bomb. I just wanted to know, you explained about how God is in control and guiding you. These days, are you finding it easier or harder to find those right roles with the state of the world? Wait, say that again. Am I finding it easier or harder? To find the right role. Uh, Nashville, or this area, Middle Tennessee, thankfully, is still a pretty conservative area. And the professional theaters are still regularly having very family-friendly choices for their seasons, which is great news for me. Um, you know, there are things being done I don't want to be a part of. But I tell you what, I tell you what, and I, I'm, I'm glad you asked this because I meant to say this. When I early on decided that I would be very picky and let the Lord guide me about what to choose, the Lord has been so faithful to me. He has been so good to me. He has blessed me. He has allowed me to play many of the greatest roles ever written for women from music theater to Shakespeare to contemporary things, I have been blessed to play Amanda Wingfield and Mama Rose and Blanche Dubois and The Witch and Into the Woods. I mean, plum roles he has blessed me with. He has been so faithful to me. I have not sat at home twiddling my thumbs, you know, with my hair getting gray with no opportunities because I've been picky at all. And I guarantee you, if you covenant with him to glorify him with everything, he is going to come through for you and surprise you. I didn't see the Corey Ten Boom role coming. I didn't even know enough to ask for something that wonderful. But, you know, God is always up to something. I, I, I kind of know the answer to this because I, I know you and I know your reputation in this area. But with, when you're with Tennessee Rap or with Studio 10, or other, we have how many... Professional companies we have. Well, the Nashville Children's Theater is professional. Yeah. And 
the rep and Studio 10. And the barn also has some guest equity contracts, but right. that's and it. It's a small town. And Shakespeare, Nashville Shakespeare. One of the it's big, not equity. It's not equity. They used to have equity contracts, but they're not doing that anymore. Well, my question would be, uh, how do you think that you're regarded among the other professionals in this area? Uh, are you regarded, oh, here comes Nan again with her, uh, with wearing her Christian hat, or are you, do you feel that you've been accepted for who you are over these 30 plus years of being yes. in Nashville? And have you paid any price? Yes, I, I do feel accepted and loved and respected. I think the key to it has always been to, uh, to be genuine, <clears throat> real, um, honest, humble. I don't. I'm, I do not behave in an arrogant way in rehearsal. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, when you always know that what you have was a gift in the first place, it keeps you from being arrogant. Um, you know, there have been some times when I've had some pushback, um, but I, I've, um, have been a part of the people's lives here in Nashville for so long. And they've walked with me for so long. And the theater community is small. But, you know, when you, when you work with people year after year after year in a place of humility and kindness, it pays off. Yeah, I was say, I kind of knew the answer to that, that you, I mean, you are greatly loved and respected in this area from everyone who knows you. Thank you. <clears throat> this gentleman here <clears throat> has a, right here, Rob, right in front of you. Um, what happens if you get uh, a, a role in, in um, let's say, something that's a Christian production, but you've got to be the bad person? Oh, that's a blast. <laughs> the, the bad people are always the most interesting people to play. No, I, because I just landed a movie where I'm the bad guy, but I've been having a hard time with the pro. The you having a hard time, like, giving yourself over to his badness? Is that what you mean? No, I, I look like a good guy, but... I am really bad. And as, I, oh, as we all are. And I had a gold digger girlfriend, so that was the hard part. Well, you look like you overcame it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when they give you a script, and then, and then as soon as you get the script, they say you're hired. And, and then they go in, right into movies. When you do Nigerian movies, they do that a lot. So. Well, that sounds like a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> well, I good know. for you. I just wondered how you would, would you do the bad roles? Because I'm, I'm a clown, so I never do bad roles. Would so. I do it? Yes, me, would I? Yeah. Well, I, you say it's a Christian movie? It's a Christian ethic movie. Yeah. A Christian ethic movie, and the bad guy, is he shown for who he is? Yeah, or is, he, is, it, is it what he does condoned and laughed at and thought fun? Well, he, he, kind, of, he kind of hides behind his good guy behavior, so... Well, um, are I people did. with a brain able to figure him out while watching this story? You know what? I didn't notice I was a bad guy until I hired the until I, I was did the part where I hired the terrorists. So, I don't. okay, this sounds real complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, right here in the blue shirt. <clears throat> uh, you've done movies and live theater. I assume you've done movies, right? No, uh, a few? A, a little bit. Mostly live theater and television, radio commercials, oh. audiobooks, that kind of thing. What's the big difference between you know, film and stage for you personally? Well, it's an acting style. Um, th the theatrical acting style is... Um, well, if, if I have to project to the back row, I'm going to make choices physically and with my voice, that I would never make if the audience was right here. So you bring things down to a much subtler, smaller, you, let's say smaller, you should always be subtle, but to a smaller realm when the camera's right here. Because if you were this and the camera here, it would be, it would be grossly overacted, it would be laughable. So it's a, it's a, it's a style choice. Of, of where, how close your audience is to you. And the camera, I mean, you can make a choice just with the blink of an eye with a camera that speaks volumes that somebody even on the fifth row wouldn't even see. Does that help? Does that answer it? Okay. 
I'm curious if, you, besides the story of the uh, your rejection of the first uh, script, can you think through your career of opportunities you've had backstage or during a production that have influenced the crew or the cast toward uh, investigating the Gospels more just because of your witness and friendships? Do you have any other illustrations along that line? Well, you're all, you've always got your antenna up every day for ways that you can be thoughtful and kind in conversation um, that make people want to know who are you and what are you all about. And it's often, the, you know, it's often it can be as, as subtle a witness as the things you don't say. Um, but I've had people, you know, come up to me and ask me, you know, where do you, where do you go to church? Because they all, they all immediately know you must be a, you're different. Um, you know, it, or, or what do you think about such and such? Just common conversation. Or when somebody is sick, or somebody has a tragedy in their lives, the way you step up to help in any way that you can is a huge opportunity to witness. The, the, the kinds of drama backstage, as you say, that you don't get involved in. And here's another thing. I refused to get into any conversation about politics. Forget it. I am not, I'd rather people wonder what I think about things than always know what I think about things. So I do not, and I don't want a door to the gospel shut because somebody knows who I voted for. It's like, it's no, it's got to always first be, you know, what my antenna up for, what would Jesus do? What's the Holy Spirit doing in this room today? Instead of my opinion about something that might get in the way. <laughs> As opposed to a mediocre question. <laughs> they've all been good. Oh, they've all been good. They've all been good. <laughs> um, I always ask this question in my video stories. So if you could give us any advice, life advice, what would it be? The like two sentences, what would it be? Life advice. Make your whole day worship and prayer. That's it your whole day, from the moment you're conscious in the bed before your feet hit the floor. Good morning, Lord. What have you got today for me? Please help me listen. Give me courage. Let there be eternal fruit. Glorify yourself through me. You know, one prayer I've been praying is give my husband, husband and me a house. Like you promised David that you would give David a house. Give us a house where every person coming from us, our children, future sons-in-law, grandchildren, every generation until you tarry, give us a house devoted to Jesus. Make us overwhelmed, overcome, wrecked, and undone with the beauty of Jesus.